Our last and um, uh, very fine speaker is Thordis um, Ingedotter, who was the chair of the last uh, uh, panel. Um, she's the associate uh, professor of law uh, at the University of uh, Reykjavik. Um, she has law degrees from the University of Iceland and from New York University. Um, she's a specialist in international law. Um, she's been among Iceland's uh, representatives in several international bodies, including uh, the European Council Steering Committee on Human Rights and also the Committee of Experts for Development of Human Rights. Um, Thordis. Minister, dear participants. Thank you for being here. And thanks, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a very impressive program. I'm privileged to be here. And it's wonderful to see uh, the breadth of speakers. Normally, academics like to talk among themselves. But here we have the policy makers. We have the people from the field. And this is extremely important dialogue. And it doesn't happen, unfortunately, that often. So many thanks. Um, I'm on the last of the program of a full day program. I will try to put out something provocative to keep you awake. There's a plenty in my field. I will talk about uh, the joint role of international courts and national courts to prosecute serious crimes. Obviously, I will not cover the whole uh, riverfront. There are so many issues. I want to misuse my position here and flag out uh, this uh, website domag.is. This was a major research on the interrelation between international and national courts in uh, prosecuting crimes done by Reykjavik University, Amsterdam University, University College of London, and Hebrew University. It was directed from Reykjavik. And it just finished. So there you will find everything I will talk about in much more details by country, by topic, and so forth. So sorry for that, but that's my job. Okay, I will address three issues. I tended to address four, but in the sake of time, I think I will just focus on those and then cop to any other issue in the uh, debate following my speak. Um, I want to first discuss, of course, this uh, rebirth of international criminal courts. Uh, the minister this morning did it so well, so that will save me a, a lot of time. When he was done, I told him, you, you you stole my presentation, <laughs> but that will, that's good. So I just I will use the opportunity just to refer part of that. Secondly, I want to address the role of national courts in prosecuting serious crimes. And just for a definition, when I'm talking about serious crimes, I'm talking about genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and torture. So and their role is really coming forth just in the last few years. Something that was not there before. But lastly, and not least, I really want to flag out some major challenges I think the whole system is uh, facing these days. So I, will, so I really want to know if my time is out because I want to make to reach that stage. Um, as for international courts and tribunals, and I said, like, um, it has been a rebirth, of, obviously, of international criminal courts. The whole... Uh, field of international criminal law was dormant for 50 years since the Nuremberg uh, and Tokyo trials. But of course, with the historical establishment of the Yugoslav Tribunal in 93, everything started again. The substantive law was there the whole time. The Geneva Conventions from 49, of course, and the Genocide Convention. So you had all the black letter of the law. Everything was there. But there was no international enforcement mechanism in the system. So the whole thing just went to the storage in law libraries, you can say. But of course, you had uh, the Yugoslav Tribunal established by the Security Council. The next year, the Rwanda Tribunal established uh, against the will of the Rwandans, if you remember, by the Security Council as well. Of course, we have the, again, historical establishment of the International Criminal Court in 98. That was a major development because there we went on, went beyond this uh, criticized uh, approach, selecting states and situations where, where we were establishing criminal courts. So this uh, selectivity was dealt with. We had a permanent international court. So that was important. 
And even in this family of international criminal courts, we had a new type of courts emerging. And that is due to a high criticism of the prior courts located far away from the victims, full international professionals located in The Hague. Or to, uh, so it was really far away from the scene. So we had uh, the emergence of this hybrid or internationalized court, like in Kosovo and Cambodia, East Timor. Like was trying, the community was trying to bring the justice closer to home, uh, located where the crimes were committed, uh, involving local professionals, even with Sierra Leone, the court was giving the mandate to prosecute national crimes as well, trying to make a little bit bridge to the national system, even though it's highly debated whether that worked or not. I will come back to that. So to make a long story short, now 20 years later after the establishment of the Yugoslav Tribunal, by my last count, we have now eight international courts out there, criminal courts, operating today. That's quite something. And, and so many milestones have been made throughout the way. And I really want to uh, emphasize this, because I'm fully aware of the debate in the General Assembly at the UN yesterday. So, I mean, <clears throat> that was put on the agenda by the Serbian presidency of the General Assembly of the UN, of course, following a fury in Serbia, following uh, the acquittal of two Croatian generals at the Yugoslav Tribunal. So I'm not sure that discussion reflects our discussion here today. But truly, many milestones throughout the way at the International Criminal Courts. Of course, very progressive development of international criminal law, obviously with respect to gender crimes, like we have touched on earlier today. Uh, equal representation of gender on the benches, quite new at the ICC. Victims' participation as victims, not as witnesses, reparation. We have no immunity of head of states before international court. We still have it at the national level. So this is a true uh, difference between the system. And now, of course, we have two situations being referred to the International Criminal Court by the Security Council, despite US earlier statement that they will veto any such attempt. We still have Libya and Sudan referred to the ICC, despite uh, US opposition to the court. And so this is a saga of international criminal courts. But I find in the whole debate of justice, in the last few years, we have truly forgot state responsibility. We always talk about individual responsibility, and that's what the international criminal courts are doing. They can only uh, deal with individual criminal responsibility. And that can be easy sometimes. We forget to talk about state responsibility. And that's even more uh, having more impact, in my view, in the longer run, it could be. And so we tend to forget International Court of Justice, its role in enforcement of uh, enforcement against criminal, international criminal crimes. We tend to get European Court of Human Rights, very important uh, jurisdiction today. And these two uh, tribunals are dealing with exactly the same cases as the, as the criminal ones. So we tend to forget that. And I remember a few years ago, I brought my students to The Hague to visit the proceedings of all these various tribunals. And uh, following the session at the International Court of Justice, we had this uh, closed conversation with one of the judges. And he said, Thortis, when I came to The Hague, I thought I was going to deal only with uh, delimination between states, law of the sea, Bjarne, this is for the, you. <laughs> and no, the whole time I've been here, only armed conflicts and human rights violation. That's the only thing I've been doing. And he's been there for like two, three years. So really the, the, the cases before this tribunal is changing. Even when you read uh, now decision at the European Court of Human Rights, which of course have thousands of cases regarding armed conflicts, for instance, from the Chesnia, Turkey, and Cyprus. And you, sometimes you're not sure if you're reading a human rights law or criminal law. They are even starting to talk about proportionality or so in their decision. So this is really uh, emerging, uh, this system. But so a lot of things going on, but still, and that's my, also maybe I'm not as positive as everyone here today, but there's always some, some problems, obviously, 
And as, the, as for the ICJ, you always feel you have taken two steps forward, but then one back. And of course, uh, so many people were disappointed with the recent decision in the case Germany versus Italy, where the court prioritized state immunity in national courts over grave mass uh, violation. So that was truly disappointing to many human rights activists. But the system is moving. Now, looking back at the criminal tribunals, of course, like I said, and I want to, again, emphasize it, so many milestones, but the picture is not one color, that's clear. And, and while it's huge progress, somehow now, and at any anniversary, ICTY now 20 years old, and ICC 10 years old, you look back, and somehow everyone is disappointed. So this, this was not the perfect solution everyone was hoping for. Of course, at the time, many people knew better. I did not. I was just really optimistic for this, the role of these courts. And why is this? There's so many, you can address so many issues. I will address only four. Of course, like was mentioned uh, by the minister this morning, uh, of course, the jurisdictional reach of this tribunal is limited. We still have so many actors not having ratified, for instance, the International Criminal Court. You have the US, you have the China, and you have the Russia. They're still not parties, even though we have 122 states. I mean, that's really impressive, though. But secondly, it's really lack of cooperation with states. It was so hailed when the Security Council referred the situation in Darfur to the ICC. But still, all these years later, the prosecutor is still not able to conduct its work in Sudan. And no one is somehow politically following that. But that's, that's the reality of the case. Great, they have the situation at the court, but they cannot work on it. And obviously, these criminal courts do, do not have police. So you still have all these so many uh, indicted persons at large, including, of course, at the ICC, Omar Basir uh, indicted for genocide. So uh, for all these years. So that's a major problem. And, but lastly, I think what everyone is realizing, and of course what has been talked about, that is the actual number of the international prosecution these tribunals are going to do. It started so great with the Yugoslav Tribunal. What, we have almost close to 170 cases. Great, they were really doing their work. Then we had the Rwanda tribunals. What do we have there? We have half of that. Okay. Then we come down to the court for special court for Sierra Leone, one dozen. Then we come to the court of Cambodia and Lebanon, and then we are down to one digit numbers. And at the ICC, I know Okampa came to Reykjavik University a few years ago, and I mean I know his unofficial policy, and it was no secret that the ICC would prosecute five individuals in each situation. So now we have the new prosecutor. I don't know her policy, but I would be surprised if that will be higher numbers. And I will come back to that later in my last point. So we have a problem. We have a huge so-called accountability gap. Like in Rwanda is the best example. Great, they have close to 80 trials. What are the Rwandans left with? One million perpetrators. So how are nations going to deal with the rest? You're kidding me. No, I'm not. <gasps> Go on, take your time. Take, you've had some to say. OK. Yes. We, we need so I mean, we had this accountability gap. And then I'm down to national courts. <laughs> and so everything has moved there now. They have to pick up the rest. That's clear. And, and they have the duty to do it. They have had it all the time. When they ratified the Geneva Convention, they were under obligation to investigate these crimes, to prosecute these crimes, whenever someone accused of these crimes happened to be in their territory, whether it was of their nationality, against their victims, or what. There was a universal jurisdiction. Exactly the same in the Torture Convention, which is truly this wonderful decision of the International Court of Justice last year, Belgium versus Senegal, it's truly said to states, you have to have a national legislation up to date. This soon, the day a treaty entered into force for its country, and that's a universal jurisdiction of that treaty, 
it has to kick on that day that treaty entered into force. So in that case, it was no excuse for Senegal not to have indicted in that case former dictator of Chad because there was no universal jurisdiction in that legislation. The court was so clear, sorry, it's a breach of international law. You have ratified this treaty. Your national legislation has to be up to date. One minute, and that what I think is the biggest challenge to the whole system. I'm going to just come back to that. Promise someone me to ask me about it. Uh, what is facing the whole system as a whole? I could cite all these legal issues and, and complication, but to me, it's so simple. It's lack of resources. We keep giving these tribunals, we keep more mandates. We keep establishing new ones. We just now established also, I think, three new human rights committees. And what are we, are we giving the money with it? No, none. And as we have been talking about the Security Council, the Security Council has now referred two situations, Darfur and Libya, not with one dollar with it. That was the price we paid for the veto of the, uh, for US not applying its veto. And now everyone is hoping that they will refer Syria, but at the same time with no money. So now you have this debate in the Assembly of State Parties, of course you want more cases, but you need money. In the last five years, the budget of the ICC has increased by 10% with double of its cases. And at the last uh, meeting of the Assembly of State Parties, the register was screaming there, very polite otherwise uh, budgetary person saying, okay, and on top of that, states are applying zero growth policy on budget. She simply stated, we are sending one message out to perpetrators out there that this court will have no teeth and you don't have to fear anything. And I conclude there. Thank you. Issues that I'm sure has sparked your curiosity and you want to know more. Um, let's start with um, whoever has the first uh, thought and if you want to direct it towards one of the speakers or to all, just let yourself know. Ah, good, hi there. I'm Chikondi Manyunga from Malawi with the guest program in the University of Iceland. I'm privileged to be part of this conference today. I've got two questions and they're being directed to the first presenter. And maybe before I do that, let me thank all the presenters for the clear presentations and thought-provoking presentations. Um, having listened to the first presenter and watched the documentary, um, it's really disheartening to see how people can um, embrace perspectives on uh, how they can embark on a genocide. And uh, the presenter further went on to talk about how can we prevent genocide in the first to the first century. The question that I have is uh, on the two that he mentioned. He talked about education as being the most important tool to address um, the issue of genocide. And then I'm thinking, the world is grappling with a lot of issues, which, um, of which I think education is being mentioned as the best tool to address them. There are issues of sustainable development, there are issues of climate change and things like that. And now we're talking about war, militarism and things like that. And the question that I have, and how closely are we working together to ensure that the paradigm of education that we are advocating for can really embrace all these issues. Because we cannot keep going one bit by bit to tackle issues at, what, at one time. I think we need to really be holistic in the way we do things. Because the target is the same student who is going through the same education system. We have to have all this knowledge together. So how closely are we working together to ensure that while we're talking about militarism, we are talking about sustainable development. The, the knowledge is really passed at the same time. The second question that I have is uh, to do with the, how can we prevent the emerging insurgencies from culminating into serious uh, genocides? I think we've learned from the past cases that okay, things had happened and others went unnoticed. But I think in the, the first session, the Indian presenter talked about emerging insurgents groups within India. And now we can also talk about the, what is happening in Nigeria. 
the Boko Haram before it culminated into serious genocides. What is it that we can do? Do we really have to wait for things to happen and then take action after after things have happened? I think those are the two questions that I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. I don't think we, we need to speak a lot about of the importance of the education. Everything what's happening uh, and the majority of the behavior of the human beings is based on the education coming from the family, uh, from the school system and so on. So, uh, but also uh, you linked education and sustainable development. Uh, there is uh, old uh, proverb, I don't know from which country exactly, which says that if you want to help somebody, don't give him the fish, teach him how to catch it. Uh, so, uh, I think that it was already mentioned uh, during the first panel that uh, investing more into education, especially in so-called developing countries or poor countries, is the best possible investment into sustainable development. It is also the best possible investment into prevention of uh, mass atrocities, uh, gender inequality, and so on. So there is no more important and more efficient tool. But we have to be careful also when we are speaking about education, which is uh, still the case today. It's not only history. We still have the we still have countries, or we still have uh, well, some groups, important groups, also radical religious groups, uh, which are teaching the population or the children or the members of those groups uh, things which are not right. This is extreme ideologies which are going to the people's heads through, through those systems. So this is also the case where we should not be silent. When we discover such things, we, we, we should point on them, we should uh, trigger actions, we should uh, make pressure, international pressure, to stop this. I mentioned this case from the Yugoslav Military Academy, where young uh, people, children, they, 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 they came there with uh, 14 years were teach that killing, you know, a group, if they are ordered is something good. They'll be awarded if they, they, they do this. So it was it was wrong, it was wrong. It, it, it led to the, those atrocities in Srebrenica and so on. It was, it was one big part of the causes for, for those atrocities. So we should be aware of the importance of the education as a tool for sustainable development, for development, for better life, and also for the prevention of such mass atrocities, but also as a tool which can work in the opposite side. And we, we should also work to prevent such, such things. It's a good warning. Yes, Valor. Do, do you want to, it's the second part of the question. Are there any, the uh, there are any lessons, lessons now for because Syria and for... Good question. Yeah, because yeah. I've been trying to also to, I was, I was trying to, uh, to make a point is that there are always different situations at any time. When you are, when you are uh, uh, dealing with, uh, I, have no, I have no local uh, knowledge of, of Nigeria. And as with the Syrian uh, situation, I mean, it seems to be very difficult to, to act uh, in in any in any military a military sense there, because uh, although the regime has totally lost any credibility and any any part of uh, of a solution has to include uh, some sort of a regime change, but uh, the opposition is also very divided and has also been uh, kind of uh, also involved in atrocities. I mean, mm -hmm. so you never, you know what, you never know what will, will come instead. So it's very difficult to, 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 to. Uh, but maybe the courts uh, can also, if, if, if the international court system can be 
activated to try to bring bring these these uh, uh, perpetrators to justice, but that also usually happens at a later stage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, following up on this discussion about genocide on the one hand and crimes against humanity on uh, on the other, because as you were mentioning, mentioning a very I thought this very interesting point that. It's, you know, there's so much focus on individuals, not on states. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is it's, it's impossible to, to really um, to get, get states convicted, basically. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, extremely difficult. It, even in the Srebrenica uh, case, you know, Serbia was not, it was a genocide, but it was a not state-sponsored Serbian genocide. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, that was the ruling. It was a mixed ruling in a way. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so the problem, so my question is whether we are, it's, whether it's, it's right to focus on this because of how the courts have, they have been so strict in how they define genocide. It has to be, go through a very, very strict criteria. And if it's not, no, it's not. Whether crimes against humanity, which have kind of now include far more diverse crimes, you know, rapes included, the war times rapes and, and uh, all kinds of displacement stuff, whether, the way to move forward is through such such a venue, rather than uh, than, than gen genocide or when it through the, uh, in legal ways. Maybe you would probably that. Yeah, Thordis. Yeah, yeah it is a uh, couple of points. I never know if this was working now. Um, yes, I think state responsibility has been in la uh, neglected. And of course, there's a political reason behind that. With respect to, of course, we had the case uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina against Serbia with respect to the genocide in Skripanitia, the court found out, it decided there was a genocide. So that was not a problem. And then, of course, the ICJ has no means to do evidentiary uh, research as needed. So they simply cited the Yugoslav Tribunal. So they said, thank you, you did the research. We find also it's a genocide. Simply, it was not orchestrated from Belgrade. Mm -hmm. But very important, because of the topic of this conference, the court concluded that Serbia failed preventing the genocide. Wow. So don't forget that. Yeah. Even though it was a really disappointing uh, decision with respect to reparation due to that. But yeah. with respect to enforcing, of course other crimes are so much easier, mm -hmm. especially war crimes. You only have to prove one incident. Crimes against humanity, you have to prove it systematic. So that's also very uh, tough threshold to reach. So war crimes is the easiest thing, mm -hmm. but also, because I mentioned this uh, recent case from last year, Belgium versus Senegal, it's a very important dictum in that case because we have so many states representatives here. That's the jurisdiction of the court and the ergo omnis obligations uh, of state parties to the torture convention, which of course now people are saying applies to other major crimes as well. Of course, the major difficulty in enforcing state responsibility is lack of jurisdiction. But like in the Torture Convention, there is a jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice, similar to the Genocide Convention. That's why we always have these genocide cases, they're not the war crimes, because the, the, the Geneva Convention do not have similar jurisdictional clause. But anyway, so the Torture Convention, there is a jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice following some procedure. But in that case, very important, the court notes that any state party to the Torture Convention can bring in to the court another state claiming that they are breaching obligations under the convention. So in theory, Iceland could even take a case, because they're part of that convention, to the International Court of Justice, saying you are not investigating or prosecuting a, a suspect located on your territory like, what, like you're obligated to do under the convention. And of course, that was the, what Belgium was doing. Mm. So they said it's an ergonomous obligation, any state could do this. Any state can have a jurisdiction. And this is very important because normally the court is really restrictive on uh, applying jurisdiction. So that's also, mm -hmm. but whether this will <laughs> lead to so many cases coming to the court, I doubt it. No one wants to throw a, a stone in a glass house, of course, but it's important to know. An impoverished glass house. <laughs> we have a chance for one more comment, question. Yes, hi talked about the responsibility to protect, it should not include, as Brazil has suggested, regime change. But it seems to me, if you have to intervene at all, if there ever is a justification, you're doing it because the state is either perpetrating these crimes that are laid out in Articles 138 and 139 of that UN document, 
which they mentioned f uh, five different times, either the state is doing it or allowing it to happen. And if you don't change that regime, what have you done? This is the political scientist in me coming out a little bit. And that is, we should make sure that we don't elide, I know you don't, but that all of us listening to you, don't elide state with regime, all right? Regime is the current, you know, cast of characters who are controlling the levers of the state. Uh, the state itself is a whole institutional structure um, which happens to be currently populated by a certain cast of characters. So um, changing a regime and dismantling and remantling a state are really different processes. Sometimes a regime has so thoroughly corrupted the institutions of a state that, dis that displacing that regime actually leaves the state in shambles. But it is something really, I think we, it's important to make the distinction not because it's angels on the head of a pin, but because it really does alter what you think is necessary in order to stop the atrocities or to stop the criminal acts. So it's just a, just a little difference to keep in, in mind, I think. Yes, that's right. Yes, right, where the regime had become the state, which is always something you can see happening ahead of time, by the way. All right? There's plenty of warning when a regime begins to become a state. Any, any thoughts, uh, Well, this is, this is the, maybe the most sensitive question when we are speaking about the, the uh, well, the, what is missing in the international order. This thin line, which is uh, the border between the justified international intervention according to the mm -hmm. uh, resolutions of uh, uh, the United Nations or the Security Council of United Nations or based on other, uh, well, uh, other, uh, well, acts or, or uh, acts of inter international law, and when, did that, when this is, uh, well, just excuse for the changing of the uh, government or the regime which is not according to your so-called national interest. So current uh, international order uh, leaves a wide range of so-called gray zone which is not so large if we, if we use normal logic. For any case, I think it's not, for any case which has happened so far, it's not so difficult to decide if this was the regime, regime change intervention or this was intervention justified but by uh, everything called atrocities or, or genocide which happened in such countries. Uh, but this, <laughs> this judgment cannot be done just by saying this intervention went on uh, with the support of the United Nations and uh, others, others didn't. Because, as I said, and this is uh, the reason we are dealing with this issue also uh, inside of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, in this, in this specific point, we, we should upgrade the international order. And when you mentioned this Brazilian, uh, Brazilian concept, responsibility while protecting, this is not the concept which is opposing the first one, the responsibility to protect. It's what it was presented by some, some well, people that this is uh, opposite concept. It is compatible, it's totally compatible, which means that, uh, of course, when the international community de decides to intervene, it should do this responsibly. So th this Brazilian, so-called Brazilian concept just uh, upgraded the responsibility to protect concept which was adopted at 2005 on the summit of the 
of the United Nations, and uh, there was li lively debate uh, la uh, last September in New York about this. And at the end, uh, it was uh, how to say concluded that this is totally com compatible, and this debate also contributed toward the toward the, the well toward the aim we are we are seeking to achieve. This is to draft this legally binding resolution, which will define more carefully when when uh, the not only intervention, because when we are speaking about this concept of responsibility to, to protect mostly, we are dealing with the only third pillar, this is intervention. And we are mostly neglecting the first two. Responsibility to protect, which is first responsibility of every member of the United Nations, every state, every government, and so on, and you mentioned this. Uh, but uh, I think that because we don't have enough uh, developed warning mechanisms, um, we are we are mostly too late for this stage. Too late. The international community is starting to deal with some uh, issues seriously when there is already killings and when the situation on the ground is so complicated that, that there is no only good solution. As it is such case now in Syria, there is no solution possible, which is only good. And this is why there are problems. Uh, if we, if we, if we, or if the international community really uh, pushed more with the so-called Kofi Annan plan at the beginning, at right? that time there were ch chances to develop well, good solution. Now it's too late and uh, I'm afraid it, it will take another time and more victims before we, we will be able to do to do something. But uh, I think that you you really catch the point, you know, this is this is the most sensitive thing when we have to work on it, we have to develop, we have to clarify this gray zone. And I think that after all these uh, events and disputes and also conflicts which a few years ago, almost destroyed the European Union when there was the intervention in Iraq. We are closer to the solution. In this case, I'm, I'm, I'm optimist. I think we will be able to, to do something within uh, next few years also to, uh, to regulate this gray zone. Well, that woke us up. There's no such thing as falling asleep with these three speakers. Um, I want to thank all three of our wonderful panelists. And a reminder, 9.30 tomorrow morning, we're back here. All right. <laughs>